We don't have cable this time, sorry guys. Yeah, we're going to I think it's nine o'clock that we can go ahead and start. Good morning, everyone. Thank you guys for coming. Um, I think most of you know me. I'm Chad Kirby, and uh, the second year instructor at Dunwoody. What we have, guys, today is we have a um, commercial project presentation. We have 10,000 square foot building. We're going to do power and lighting and low voltage for this building. Um, I do have Joe is going to do um, be the master of ceremony today, so he'll talk a little bit about what we did for this project. But we basically need power, 
lighting and low voltage. We did short circuit analysis and coordinate, coordination and arc flash. Uh, no estimation this time. We did a lot of calculation, load calculation and so forth. So the pro I gave you guys, everyone should have an agenda for the day. So we do have five teams presenting for you today. Um, uh, we're going to do a first uh, first three teams, and we'll have a break so you can have a, you guys have a chance to look at their projects right behind Gary on the wall. And um, then after that, we're going to do two teams, and then we'll uh, we'll wrap up. And uh, after after that, at 11 o'clock, we have um, our friend Gary Whiteman is retiring, so we're going to have a little bit get together after the presentation. So that's the agenda for you. I know some of you guys are hiring, and they always want to know the names of the students who are doing the presentation. I gave you this sheet. This sheet um, has the present the students who are presenting, as well as the topic for the presentation, like we have done in the past. Uh, these are topics that you're supposed to present on. And it's both sides, so double-sided. That particular one, double-sided, just FYI. I do have one sheet I would like you guys to give to me. This is the evaluation of the students individually or as a team. So if you can sketch from uh, one to 10, 10 being the, the best, what you think about the students individually as well as the team. I really appreciate this one, this one I need. Okay, so that's what, uh, what we're gonna do for, for the show today. I wanna remind you, all the students work on teams and they finish the project, power lighting and low voltage. They did the analysis and they did the load calculation. But today, because of the time, they're going to be presenting only on one aspect of the class. So that doesn't mean they didn't do everything. They will be only presenting in one aspect. And when you guys have a chance during the break and after, we have the uh, project portfolios right here. So I'm going to you guys to swing by and look at your project portfolios. Uh, without further ado, my partner for the last, um, uh, with me, 11 years, um, teaching in electrical design, Gary Ryman. Uh, is going to say a few words to the grads, and then um, we'll go from there. Go ahead, Gary. Thank you, Chad. I uh, actually put more thought into this speech than I usually do because uh, it may be the last time that I get to address this group in this fashion. Uh, at first, I thought I would do my Nicholas David impersonation from The Voice. And he's going to third place, but I thought he was pretty good. <laughs> and then I was thinking about the students and what would be important for me to talk about. And recently I've looked at some stuff about troubleshooting, and everybody always wants to know about troubleshooting systems and things. And I thought, oh no, that's, I can't do that. And, and then I started thinking about working here at Dunwoody and all the leadership opportunities that I've been given and how wonderful that is. And but when I, I was doing some work on that, they had 10 things, and I wasn't sure I could remember 10 things when I got up here in front of everybody. So finally, I decided that today, Students Hall uh, is a little bit uh, celebrating my retirement, which makes it somewhat uncomfortable to be in front of a lot of people in that fashion. Uh, I would talk about decision making, because I, I think we work in an industry that every day you are required to make decisions. And we're in a technical industry, so a lot of our decisions are data-driven decisions that involve you know, math and calculations and things like that. <coughs> and so I, I thought that was important, but really in life, making decisions is a lot more than that. So I thought I would try to pass on a few words of, of what seems to work for me. So uh, when you have to make big decisions in life, whether it's uh, work decisions or wherever, Usually, uh, most of us are going to start thinking about it in kind of a rational, logical way of going through and using our brain to decide maybe what we should do. Unfortunately, if you do that, it will never be enough, and, and it just won't quite make the grade. Uh, when you come up to the big decisions, you also have to pay some attention to the second thing, which is your heart. And in that, you have to ask yourself, you know, is this going to be something that uh, has integrity. It's going to be something that will be good for my family. It will be something that uh, is good to me for me. So sometimes you can't let your brain into thinking that just because uh, you figured out something, that doesn't mean it's okay. You, you still have to verify that your heart muscles out there and make sure that it's that you're in consistent alignment with your values. However, doing that doesn't ever seem to be quite enough. So the first thing, and 
like the last thing that I want to talk about is paying attention to your gut. Because when you get that gut feeling, uh, in my experience, don't ignore it. Because it will save you. It will save you from doing some things that probably later on you'll be glad that you didn't do. And also, when you can get your brain to tell you something rationally that, that it's okay, and, and when you get it confirmed with your heart that this is the okay thing to do in terms of your values and your family and everything, and then when you really get that center feeling down in your gut that this is, this is the way to go, then you got that triple threat going, and, and then you go over it. Uh, proceed with that, and I think everything will work out fine. Uh, I had the opportunity to work here for a long time, and I, I worked in a lot of other situations, and those are the three things that you should pay attention to when you have to make some of the big decisions. Just watch your head, think it through, talk it over, look at it from your heart, and pay attention to your gut. Thank you, it's been an honor to serve, and I look forward to new ways of being of service to Dunwoody. This is the end of the line, I'm not sure that I'm going anywhere, but it will be a big change in my status and in, and in the way I do things. Thank you, and with that, I'll turn it back over to Mr. Jim. Thank you, Gary. As you guys know, today is uh, Gary's retirement party. We're going to start at 11 to 12. I would love you guys to stick around if you have a chance. Without further ado, we're going to ask Joe, my friend, to swing by here and we start the presentation. So let me turn the lights to the right. There you go. Good morning, everyone. Thank you again for coming out. We know that you're very busy. I love busy. But it's a big deal to us as students to see the industry coming in and observing our work. I look at us as the future of this industry and so to get your knowledge and experience. So again, thank you for taking time out and coming out. So this quarter, this semester, we designed a complete functional electrical system at a 10,000 square foot commercial building with the addition of a 5,000 square foot add-on. We were divided into teams of two. Each team completed the entire project all by themselves, but today we're only going to give everybody a chance to break it down into different sections so we can attack everything so we're not here all day. We went over certain aspects of the design, such as drawing, uh, loan calculations, Minnesota Energy Code, generator sizing, lighting calculations, cut sheets. Uh, we put together PowerPoint presentations and a reflective statement where we each have one in our mind. Feel free to take a look at that when you get a chance. Each team will present part of the project, and if you have any questions, please feel free to ask. Our first team today is Aaron Erickson, who is currently looking for a position, and Terry Gillard, who is working for Ben Franklin. They're going to talk about the title sheet, symbols, one-line diagrams, power system operations, equipment cut sheets, and the electric load calculations. Why not, fellas? Hi, I'm Aaron Erickson. This is uh, Terry Gillard. Uh, we're TV Electric, and we'll start out with explaining E1 through E10. Just kind of a quick uh, overlay of what we did here. This is the title sheet. Um, you should have a Actually, it's a southwest uh, view of the building, and then we have the drafting sheets, 11 different sheets that are going to be in the drafting sheets. E2 is our symbols, which uh, I will explain a little bit more in depth uh, in a little bit. This is um, the power riser, which shows the um, surface entrance equipment and uh, the feeders, the sizing of the conduit and the uh, um, sizing of the, the conductor. E4 here is our external <coughs> our exterior lighting um, to uh, we're showing uh, underground conduit PVC as, as well as our pole and wall mounting fixtures. This is the, um, the luminaire graph the, the lighting drafting sheet that shows all the different uh, luminaires and it um, it is broken down by circuit and by the different types of lighting. This is E6, this is our power diagram showing the step poles, uh, mechanical equipment, etc. 
this is the um, mobile subsystems graphing sheet. It has fire alarm system, the security system, and the phone data. E7.1 is a breakdown of our low voltage rising, um, security, fire, and falling. This is the um, schedule graphing sheet of the three different panels, listing what each of the different circuits are like on each one of the panels. And E9 is a breakdown of both our uh, lighting fixture schedule, our um, and our mechanical schedule. This is a detailed sheet showing the current state um, detail of the generator tab detail on the full page of how it's not the lighting pulse. Uh, let me get into our riser. As you see here, we have our transformer that is feeding our meter. And then that meter feeds our HDF. And then in the act of a power outage, our generator will get turned on by the HDF feeding from HDF to our main panel and to our reception panel. And the main panel is also uh, feeding our lighting panel. You see here, here's some of our symbols breaking down. The ones in yellow here are the ones we mainly use. There's a, a panel board, um, four flex, three flex accessible, here's a switch, split accessible. Um, and then also here, the main one we use for exposed conduit, underground um, conduit. And then also for our systems, the main ones we use in this part is like a TV, and also our communication outlet for data and uh, phone. Also for our fire alarm, you can see here our uh, fire alarm resonator panel, our fire fire alarm control panel, and also the main one we use up here is is the uh, fire alarm horn and stroke. This is a riser diagram we produce on FKM. Um, it shows the same as it's a one line diagram. It shows the same as the riser. Once again, XL utility feeding. The, the meter to the HDF, power outage feeds the generator to the HDF, and then same as the riser where our main panel feeds our lighting and reception. This is also uh, done on the same program. It's a uh, <coughs> current protection device, fault current coordination. Um, actually, Darren and Andrew will go in more into depth for what this is, but this is our main in the art. Uh, Receptor panel and lighting panel coordination. Also, we use um, Cummins power sleeve to size our generator. At the end of it, we came up with a 200 uh, kW generator, 250 kVA, and 50 Hertz. Um, Jamie also is going to touch a little bit on this program. And here is the touch sheet for our generator. As I said, it's a 200 kW. We went with Generac, mainly because the fix the touch sheet was clear. Um, 200 250 kVA. And it's a standby transformer. Each fact we have a um, separate emergency um, system with battery battery operated uh, bridge plug. And I'll do a little bit more. Right. I'm going to do the the load calculation. We started with um, receptacle load calculation for MEC 220.14i. We had um, 84 duplex receptacles and 37 quad receptacles, giving us a total of about 28 kVA from those. Then we do, did the um, Duray factor based on the demand factor. We take the first 10,000. Um, Square feet give us 10 um, kVA, and then we derive the second, um, the rest of it at 50%, giving us a total of uh, 19 kVA. Then we added um, another 10,000 for the, we added another 10,000 for the expansion and anticipation, giving us uh, 28 kVA. Um, oh, sorry. Um, we oh we compared that 
at the 10,000 KVA, including the highest giving us 28 KVA. And then we added 5,000 for the 5,000 bank and giving us, um, giving us the total KVA from the steps below. Then the lighting load, we take, um, we take per MEC t um, table 220.12, we had um, 10,000 square feet at 3.5 per um, 3.5 per kVA per um, square foot, giving us 35,000 kVA. And we had an actual of about 18,000 kVA. And we take the highest of the two, giving us 35,000 kVA. Um, and then we did a general lighting. We did the expansion, added the expansion of 5,000, giving us another 17.5 kVA. We had a window of sign, and we had um, for 1,200 volt amps, and then we had parking lot for 1,000 volt amps. Um, multiplied by 1.25 as continuous load, given us a total of 68 kVA for the lighting. We then um, switched the light machine down here with the panels and layer and found that size. And then we took those two. Um, load and added the mobile <coughs> load, which we had four different heaters, a boiler control, um, two condensing units, a file server, AC, and, um, and then two boiler pumps, three exhaust fans, an air handling unit, and it was found um, interest hidden pumps at the total KVA of the main panel. And then this will show where the um, difference, we have the main panel of what, 171 KVA, the receptacle panel of 26, 26, and the lighting panel of 68, divided by 208 and 1.732 to give us our amps for um, each one of the different um, panels giving us a 500 amp main panel, a 225 amp lighting panel, and a 100 amp um, receptacle panel. And then we sized our conduits and our wiring um, based on the temperature that conductors are found. And then these are test sheets for the last for, um, for the um, service production for the uh, auto transfer switch, CT cabinet, 500 amp main panel, and a 300.5 amp lighting panel and 100 amp receptacle. Any questions? Thank you. Uh, the, the spreadsheet that you use for the load calculation, is that a commercial product or something you develop? That's what I got. Could you, uh, could you consider? Uh, using a generator for your light source load, but I mean, like you say, maybe throw a little battery light source light source. Yeah. I'm just curious for you, no. maybe um, this uh, more possible with you. No, we didn't have to even. Uh, we the whole time we're running on using battery. Battery. Yep. You just run the whole thing on the gen set. Right. For us. Awesome. Yeah. Thank you. Johnson, Minot Enterprises, and Zach Lindbergh with Northern Electric. They're going to talk to you today about power outlet layout and circuiting, power panel scheduling, schedule sorry, equipment touch sheet, mechanical equipment layout and circuiting, mechanical equipment schedule, and the project schedule as a whole. I'm Jeff Johnson. Uh, um, like Joe said, we're uh, taking care of uh, the power outlet layout and circuiting, um, equipment set sheet, mechanical equipment layout, mechanical equipment schedule, and the project schedule. 
This is our uh, general overview of the power plant first floor. Um, we went with six circuits per 20, or six duplex receptacles per 20 amp circuits as, a, as our uh, general purpose stuff. We decided to go with a maximum of three fourplex circuits per, or sorry, three fourplex outlets per 20 amp circuit for our uh, technology. And you can see we've got some outside GSPIs by the doors. Uh, we've got another uh, GSPI <coughs> to serve us our mechanical equipment outside of the mechanical room. Uh, this is a zoom view of our lunchroom and closed office. Um, got a lot of dedicated circuits in here for our uh, kitchen equipment. We've got a dedicated 20 amp circuit for a dedicated 20 amp circuit for our vending right here. Got another dedicated 20 amp uh, GSPI here for our coffee pot, which is also ran through our lighting control panel. So uh, if any of the employees leave it on, it uh, turns off with the rest of the stuff in the building. Um, our microwave is on another 20 amp. Um, we got a hardwired connection right here for our dishwasher. We got JBox. Uh, we've got a TV quad receptacle here for technology, mounted at 84 inches above from the floor. Here's another um, zoom view of our open office. Um, this room basically consists of uh, largely modular power furniture. And uh, that furniture is powered by these J boxes right here. We've got four of them. And each one of those is fed with three different circuits from our RP panel. Each one of those circuits uh, feeds, or each one of those J boxes feeds five cubicles maximum. Um, we've got uh, three hots and three neutrals for that, two hots. I should say two of the hot conductors, two of the circuits go to the um, data equipment circuit for those two. The remaining hot goes to the cast lighting, which is also routed through the lighting control panel to turn that off at night. This is another open office. This is a basic cubicle layout. We've got uh, one fourplex for technology. <coughs> per cubicle, we've got one standard duplex for um, general things, uh, and that's typical for each cubicle. This is our alternate layout for some of the special use areas. Um, we've got a print room, which is right here. We've got uh, two duplex receptacles for plotters. Uh, they are also technology outlets. They have a separate hot neutral and ground for those. And our coffee room, we've got a GSPI for the coffee pot. That's also routed through the uh, lighting control panel. You can turn that off at night. Dedicated circuit for the copier. Um, Two duplex receptacles for our printer and fax in that room. Then our server room, which is right here, has three dedicated circuit quad receptacles for server power. In case you're wondering, our lights could be looking at a door. Architect issue. <laughs> this is the receptacle panel schedule. Our receptacle panel is a uh, hard amp square E, uh, 84 circuit panel. We're using 55 of those 84 circuits. Uh, so we've got a little bit of room for expansion. The um, cut sheets for our panels, uh, we are we're using square E, I line, and MQ panels. Uh, we've got a 500 amp main panel, main breaker. We have a 220, a 225 amp lighting panel, main lugs only, and a 100 amp, 
100 amp receptacle panel that is also a main link joiner. Power system 208 120Y, three phase four loader. Our meter center, also a square G, easy meter pack ram, main log terminal box, same power system 208 120Y, three phase, uh, Zima 3R, upgraded the uh, bus rating at 800 amps. Questions so far? No, I think. Uh, the mechanical equipment layout. So as you can see, most of it is in this uh, what's called vertical ring. So we have a camera unit here and a portal there. The final portal is through there. Uh, exhaust fan. And in the vestibule, there's another camera unit here. And then the sitting room on the dinner table. There's a portal on those two here. And this is uh, a close up view of the electrical sample room. It's got the AQ, uh, gas boiler, control circuit, boiler uh, pump, boiler pump, uh, recirculating pump, and uh, unit heat, horizontal unit heater up there. So, this is the main panel schedule. This is where all of our mechanical equipment is going to be at. Uh, it's got the gas boiler and It's a 100, uh, 100 amp or 500 amp uh, main lock only panel, and this is uh, for mechanical equipment. It's got a uh, air handling unit that's three phase, 200 amp <coughs> full, full of experience at 34 amp, and it's fed from the main panel with three main fan uh, conductors. And it's a 125 amp bolt current suspension device. Uh, you've got a condenser unit. Three phase 208 volt uh, full current at 81 and 26 amp. And that's fed from our main panel as well, so it's three and a half volt. We've got con uh, another condenser unit for, for future use for the add on. Uh, three phase 208 volt 44.8 amp. Uh, fed from the uh, main panel with three and a half eight. Uh, gas boiler control. Uh, single phase 120 volt. Full load current at 4.2 amps, and it's fed from the main panel with three hundred volt. Both the boiler pumps are the same. There's a three phase, 208 volt, uh, full load current at 7.5 amps, and that's uh, they're both fed from the main panel with three hundred volt. Uh, the recirculating pump, single phase, 120 volt, uh, 2.2 full load amps, uh, fed from the main panel with three hundred volt. We have two cabinet unit heaters, as I said, uh, single phase, 120 volt, 5.8 volt amp, and uh, fed from the main panel with 300 volt. Two horizontal heater units, same fan, single phase, 120 volt, full load current, uh, 4.4 amp, and that's fed with 300 volt from the main panel. And then we got three exhaust fans, all in there are same, uh, single phase, 120 volt, full load current at 5.8 amp. And then we got the pile for the rating for these is a single phase 208 volt, uh, 12.7 full of amp, fed from the main panel with 300 volt. And this is our generator that we uh, picked out. It's, uh, we picked a 200 and a kilowatt Cummins diesel generator. It's fed to the ATS power transfer switch with two sets of two and a half inch CBC schedule 80s, three uh, 250 KCM CHHW and one 2 off AWD CHW or CHHW diesel, and a 500 amp uh, overcurrent suspension device. Uh, the odd iron transfer switch, um, it's a 600 amp Cummins cold transmission ATS. It's fed from the meter room cabinet with two sets of two and a half inch CBC schedule 80. Three 250 KCM CHW and one two off AWD diesel, <coughs> and another 500 amp over current suspension device. And this is uh, our project schedule. Um, it's been simulating the project and Microsoft project to determine the length of time it's going to take uh, to complete this project is around 79 days. Uh, 
to design the project, it took uh, 62 days. That includes starting the plans, uh, even on 3D plans. Uh, and having meetings with Calder Engineering, Kohler, Jason Associates, Simplex slash Reynolds, RL, Lyazar and Associates Incorporated, Verdi, and Colorado. Uh, for the construction part, of the project, we estimate that it took, uh, we'll take around 15 days. Uh, this includes the roughing, roughing inspections, installing the devices, the final inspection, and the final walkthrough of the truck plan. No questions? Comments? <coughs> you, you, uh, maybe I missed this at the beginning. Is there a lease space in this facility? Is that why you wanted a meter sunken? Or why did you choose to go to a meter sunken? Um, well, I was the, uh, it's, it's a main terminal box. I mean, Square D calls it a meter center. Okay. Um, that's just the manufacturer. So it's just one meter. Yeah, yeah, exactly. It's just it, 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 is, it covers space. both. You know, I usually call them CC caps. So because I used to work in the field, so that's what we would always call them. They went under meter center. Wow. Did You, you, you had a 125 amp panel yeah. that was covered number four. There should have been a 100 amp panel. Uh, there should have been what? Uh, it should be a 100 amp panel. A 100 amp panel. Mm -hmm. Are you talking about the eight amp panel that was already in the show? Yeah, we had a 100 amp panel, I believe it's set of number three. Uh, the, are you referring to the receptacle panel? Pardon? Are you, are you uh, referring to the 100 amp receptacle panel? Yes. And then, curious as to why you chose close to and an automatic transfer to what that, how that impacted you on the area. We know they're more expensive. Um, open transition is typically cheaper. Um, I decided to go with the closed transition because it's a little bit shorter delay, you know, and uh, the flicker of the light, you know, between the transitions. I guess that was, that was uh, well, you're still it. using it for standby. You're not using it for low curtailment or peak curtailment. Just standby. Anything else? Thank you. Thank you. Our next team, the best team, I might be biased, but that's okay. <laughs> Myself and my partner Adam, I work for Eagan Company that is currently looking for a position. We're going to be talking about inside and outside lighting, luminaires, uh, luminaires layout, inside out, outside lighting calculation using visual software, inside <coughs> outside lighting, clicking and control, luminaires and outside schedule. Lighting panel and control panel schedule. Inside lighting test suite and the specifications. Hey, hi everyone, I'm Adam with Field Sand. And a little overview of what we're going to be talking about today. Like you said, inside and outside lighting, so luminaire layout, the calculation using our visual software, circuiting control, the luminaires and outside schedules, and the lighting panel and control panel schedule inside lighting touch sheets and the specifications. Right here is the top view layout of all of our luminaires in our building. It's another view from the southwest isometric corner. Here's our luminaire schedule. For most of the lights we use linear fluorescence, but in some areas such as the secretary's office and one of the conference rooms, we use recess fluorescent lighting, compact fluorescent lighting. Here is some of the statistics on our luminaires for inside. You can see for the statistics, the average foot candles, the max foot candles, middle foot candles, and then the ratios, max to min and average to min. And for most of the max to min was four to one. Here's the top view 
of our outdoor luminaires. They have like five pole mounted lights. And you can see them always go right back to the calculation zone. Here's the southeast isometric view of our pole mounted lights in the parking lot. This is the luminaire schedule for our outdoor lights. This first one is our pole mounted lights, which were 400 watt, I believe. And these ones were the building mounted lights. And then also the statistics for our outdoor luminaire. For our lighting calculation, we used the uh, visual software. We imported our building layout from AutoCAD. And then after we created lighting zones using either the lumen method or draw manually drawing rectangular or polygonal zones. After we drew the zones, we placed the luminaires inside the zones. And after placing them, we generated statistics to make sure they comply with compliance requirements. Here's our first step. I was importing the layout from CAD, which we got from CAD. Here is all of our lighting zones, all the green areas, all our different lighting zones. And uh, for the square ones, for the rectangular ones, we used the lumen method, which we found was much easier. And for the odd shaped ones, such as this open office 126, we had to manually draw a polygonal lighting zone and place fixtures and get them checked pretty much. Here's a zoom view of the conference room. You can see we have three speed checks, compact fluorescent lights here, and then three linear fluorescent lights here. Just one example of the room. And uh, for that same conference room, here are statistics. We generate statistics for all the rooms to make sure the foot candle levels comply with our client's request. So this room, I think it was 40 foot candles is what the client requested. Now I'll hand it over to Jill. <coughs> we also had to not only place the lights, but we had to figure out how to turn them on and off. So we used lighting circuiting and control. Uh, we put 18 lights per circuit throughout our building. Mostly use oxygen sensors just for the Minnesota energy code, trying to get that under the score. Um, we use dimming systems in the conference room that we showed, just because you know a lot of times in the conference room they want to adjust the lights as the customer wants that. So we also use three-way switches in the hallways primarily. In one area of the office or oh, Office areas use two way switching, but the majority of it was oxygen, oxygen sensors. This is uh, our lighting panel, 225 watt, or sorry, excuse me, 225 amps, main log only. Revit generated this panel for us, panel schedule, after we laid out the lights and circuited everything. And what's the nice thing about Revit, it just calculates all this stuff for us and puts it into perspective easily. Uh, Pretty cut and dry. There's a lot of room in this panel left for expansion and whatnot. So that's what the customer wants, so that's what we did. Here's our control panel. Basically, what the control panel is doing is it is just telling the relays to turn the lights on and off. Down here, these are not in the lighting panel. These are in the reception panel, so like the coffee pot and whatnot. All that is set so that there's a timer for sweep. So at night, everything gets sweeped off to make sure that. It just says our top and bottom and on and, and whatnot. Not a problem. We also had to get cut sheets for our, our uh, fixtures. Cut sheets are great. You know, we use them all the time at work. They're great for the customer. They're great for us. You know, the customer can verify that that's the fixture that they want. We can verify that it matches up to what we need as far as our calculations and whatnot. Uh, we'll submit them and put them in the O and M. And just overall to make sure that we have the correct fixture that we're installing so that we don't have to go back and redo the work again. We also have to talk about specifications. Everyone knows what the specs are. Uh, big binder full of all the rules and whatnot. 
to do in a project. As far as for what we have to do, we have to follow Division 26. We might have to also follow the mechanical side and stuff like that. But primarily, what we focus on is Division 26. Um, basically, like I said, it's just an index of where everything is, what we need, how we have to do the job, some impression. And I'll read your dispatch. <laughs> Tell me more. I just want to break one out real quick to kind of show you guys. This was uh, section 26, 0501, general provisions. Basically, this is just a breakdown of what we have to do overall for the electrical side. Part one is just the general, like I said, it's just basically what we have to do. Part two is uh, product for this spec. It wasn't app, uh, applicable. App, excuse me. We didn't have to use it. <laughs> <laughs> Part three is the execution. How we're going to do it, why we have to do it the way we do it, you know, for the code, the energy code, things like that. Um, make sure that everything's done working like it's back and cleaned up when you're done. All these little details are in fact you have to make sure you read it so that the customer isn't unsatisfied with all those again. Here's some more. Again, the specs are pretty long, but like I said, you, you go through it. Here's another breakout that I did. This one is on uh, exterior lighting. I thought that it fit well for our team because we're talking about lights. Again, this this spec wanted us to do. Uh, it talked about a general, you know, a general point, which would be this middle and the product. You know, like that goes back to our spec sheet or our touch sheet. Make sure we have the right fixtures and the areas and you know the dimming lights and things like that. And again, the execution. How we're going to install the fixtures? Are we going to put a whip on it? Are we emceeing everything? Is it going to be sub up? Things like that are all covered in the spec. <coughs> and then the final inspect inspection, which again will fall back onto us. We'll have to get the inspector out to make sure that the job is done correctly. So if you guys have any questions? Thanks for saying always read the spec. Sometimes you feel like you're wasting that time writing. <laughs> <laughs> But uh, with regard to your outside lights, did you find that you needed to do voltage drop calculations besides the circuits for those for this project? Yeah, I think I forget which team was covering the voltage drop, but yeah, we needed to uh, calculate for voltage drop to the long distance run. Joe, I do have one observation. You guys did this in Revit too, but you didn't show it, right? Everybody understand that you did the whole thing in Revit too, the the power nails. Yeah. So Joe's Joe's yeah. project is right here, Joe and Adams. Um, so they, they after they finished the visual, because you showed that the visual, um, they brought the whole thing into into Revit and they circuited directly into Revit. So Basically I just what we wasn't did sure. Was for visual was a good way for us to lay out and get a good look of where the foot panels were going to be to ensure like in the parking lot, to ensure that this is all covered with uh, lights. We're all working with covered with lights. Same with the inside. So that's why we utilize visual and then importing it back to Revit so that we can make nice clean drawings. It's a nice one extra step, but it, it, it helps a lot for us to figure out exactly what we're going to do. Did you do battery tests for your project? Did you have any also? Or did you yeah. Did you just test it just running through visual to see where you came from? Yeah, we did. I put the test. Those ones were good ones. I think it's really good. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry. Maybe <laughs> <laughs> I don't think we did on those. It was an option for us. We just ran out of time instead of like the. Any other questions? Okay. Well, thanks again. We're gonna take a quick break. Stretch your legs. Take a look at our drawings. Take a look at our project binders. Um, don't be too mean to us when you talk about this. <laughs> Thank you, Drew. I was just, I think it's running by itself. I hope so. I was, was you running just one shot of rubber? That's what I was looking for. I just wanted to make sure what was you running. I would shop at the layout and circuiting oh, rabbit. Yeah. One shot. You know what I mean? That's yeah. all right. That's okay. That's that's what I was <laughs> trying to. I didn't mean to just to make sure they understand that you took on the rabbit because the rabbit you circuited and you had. Uh, that's what I talked about when I did this. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so hard and red eye. Yeah. Hey guy, how's it going, man? Everybody stretch their legs, ready to keep going, get the blood flowing.
Our next team is Janie Falk, the, uh, the Lone Ranger. He's going to be doing <laughs> generator sides in a cut sheet, automatic transfer switch sides in a cut sheet, and the Minnesota energy calculation inside the valve. Janie? Good morning, everybody. My name is Jamie Holt. I'm going to be doing uh, generator sizing, uh, cut sheet, ATS, and uh, Minnesota Energy Code. We use uh, Cummings Power Suite for our generator sizing software. As you see, the upper part from here up is all uh, default settings when we put in our parameters. Our main concern is <coughs> the lower part, our fuel type. Control diesel frequency at 60 hertz. Uh, our duty standby, pre phase, and then our uh, type of voltage 120 uh, wide configuration. Once we started, we took our uh, lighting and receptacle panels and entered in the information from them what our load was, uh, as you can see. We're looking at an input, uh, input of uh, 77 kVAs. Um, then we added our motors, our air handling unit, our uh, handling unit heaters, our chiller, uh, future chiller, uh, AC for the server room, and then our uh, boiler pumps, the circulating pump, a couple of uh, heating units, and then exhaust fans in the bathrooms and in the uh, server room. Once we did that, we had to choose at what point in time we wanted them to start up. You know, everything's not going to start when the generator starts. It's just we're going to need a, a certain amount of generator flow. Um, we gave it 10 seconds to get up to full speed, and then we had to choose uh, what our priority was. Uh, we started for step one after 10 seconds was our lighting and uh, receptacle panel. After the next 10 seconds, uh, we chose the AC and the uh, gas boiler control circuit was very minimal, so we threw that on there also. Um, that was kind of a priority. We don't want our server to overheat and uh, to go down. Uh, step three was our air handling unit and the boiler pumps. And step four was the uh, cabinet heaters, chillers, and step five was the fans, the exhaust fans, and finally step six. So after about 70 seconds, the whole building was going to be powered up. With that, we had to run our the uh, calculations for it. This is one of five pages that came up. Tells you information that you put in, what type of fuel was pre-phase, um, tells you the calculated loads, uh, and it also breaks it down per step, and what order you uh, measure can come up. As you're, as you're running, or once you're done, it came up, since we're using Cummings, it came up with a Cummings generator. Uh, somebody had already talked about it. It shows there's uh, 200 GEFC to 200 kilovolt amps would be the perfect size generator for the project we're using. The actual building doesn't have a <coughs> generator for it, but we were required to put one in it. It breaks it down through your running KVAs. Uh, this one shows 189 goes into your generator set, the configuration, uh, the engine model, breaks down to the cylinders, your voltage range, and also your temp when it starts up, and then comes down to the uh, performance of it. Uh, with everything started up, it says it's going to be running at 86.2% of capacity. So it does allow you a little bit of future expansion. Uh, it also gets in your uh, voltage dip, we put a max of 15%. Uh, on the starting, 
for the peak, we put zero. The frequency dip, we put max of five percent. And it uh, tells you the rating of the alternator and the temperature. And it also uh, goes into some of the load requirements that uh, were pretty much uh, given information for default information. For the generator, this is the uh, country of the generator itself. Goes into a couple different models. Uh, I think somebody had actually already brought it up. The actual generator, the 6CP uh, AA8. Um, ATF sizing, there wasn't a lot of stuff we had to do for it. We had to choose one that uh, fit our main service of 500 amps. The actual, this one I chose. Uh, has a rating of uh, 100 to 1200 amps at 600 volts, uh, two or three pole. <coughs> the uh, bypass isolation, uh, we are talking to another person, you know, a disconnect can be put in there also so it can look at your disconnect. <coughs> Minnesota Energy Code is now a little bit more time consuming. The standard we're using is 2010. Uh, I believe Minnesota right now is still 2004, is what they're recognizing. So we went to an actual stricter standard. And using a lot of fluorescent light, most of us probably failed when we ran our calculation. We started out in general just telling the type of building it was new construction, uh, in, inputting the basic information for all the uh, offices and corridors, the square footage of each one. Um, it was nice, you know, we used a lot of visual, the stuff we used came up with all our square footage that was taken uh, information off our visual schedules and stats and input it in, so it saves a lot of time from having to redo it. Which came up with a total calculated area of uh, just under 9,400 square feet. We calculated uh, 17,500 square feet for the uh, parking lot area. And then uh, going through, adding the rest of the information uh, we used our video schedule, telling what type of lamp we were using. 90% of them were fluorescent or complex fluorescents. Um, using our visual schedules, we used our wattage, what we decided to use. Um, all the electronic ballasts, the uh, lamps for each fixture, the number of fixtures in each area, and the exception allowance is if you're using an occupancy sensor or something, you got an allowance for it. We do that for each one of our areas. And on the bottom right, you can kind of see the uh, negative 36 is it was 36 percent worse than what it should be. Once that was all inputted. We ran our calculation, and this is the uh, report we printed out. Uh, <coughs> it broke down each area. It told us what we were calculated at and what we were allowed to be. Um, our allowance was 9,600, and the proposed came up with 15,000. We were told that we didn't have to make it pass on this project. Uh, the next project, industrial, we have to make it pass. So we were kind of stuck. Me and Solo, I kind of ran out of time to change everything out. To get it to pass, we probably would have had to drop a lamp out of some of the fixtures. Instead of using three, we got down to two. 
uh, Josh on the front floor that we look forward to seeing you at the staff. <coughs> then we also had to do one for the uh, exterior. This one was actually a lot easier. Uh, with the 17,000 that I was allowed uh, up to 600 watts. And I actually came in using 100 watt with five uh, fixtures. I came in at 500. So I actually, uh, that one I passed. Actually, our industrial, we are using all the LEDs. So, so this was kind of break the ice with the software. We get familiarized yeah. with what it is and what it does, what it's good for. And next time, we'll be using a lot of LEDs and make sure that comes back. And you would be, you would be in the whole building, yes. not the space by space. Uh, it started out we, it came up with space by space, you know, yeah, three or four for this office. Uh, the largest was one of the open offices, which would be 1,600 square feet, I believe it was. So it broke it down that way, and then it combined all three controls. How many total did you say that for an official sale? Uh, it, it, it had a choice between two and three and four poles. Okay, what, what did you choose this time? Uh, four poles. Well, we don't want your guys getting hurt. <laughs> you know, I mean, with the transfer switch, you know, back to you is uh, a very serious concern. You know, if something doesn't work and your generator starts up and starts back to that line, your guys are going to be the first ones to get hurt. I don't work for that show. So I just have friends that do. So, I mean, it's, <laughs> it's all safe. Like like there's a lot of just a couple more. And it, it allows you to work on things, you know, kind of isolate if you need to work on a certain part of it, it allows you to do that, not switch the whole thing, so. Any more questions? We have a uh, bypass isolation right now with the generator. Is it also, it's not also a uh, post transition for the MSU? No, it's a bypass isolation. <laughs> We have one team left, and it consists of Andrew Chuba, who works at Ace Electric, and Darren Olson, who works at Parsons. They're going to talk about fire alarm systems, the layout and risers, security systems, layout and risers, telephone data systems, layout and risers, touch sheets, and power system analysis. I'm Andrew. Thank I'm Barry. Uh, this is a fire alarm system we did in the building. You can see there's a smoke detector. And in the open office, it's every I come every 30 feet. And then uh, in every room, there's a <coughs> smoke detector as well. You can see right here, these are control panels. And then the enunciator panel is down by the door. And with each door, I think that's a manual pull station. And then uh, instead of uh, the horn in the bathroom, we just did visual for because of the echo that would be in there. And then here's just a close up in front of the side of the building. Uh, put smoke detectors in there. You can see they're in every room. There's a control panel there. There's a horn scroll here, here, here. 
see here's the riser. Like back here, we split it into four zones, so it goes kind of like this, and then like that, in the center. And so it needs to go in there. The smoke detector, the dust smoke detector, four switch, tamper switch, and manual pull. And then on this side of it, it's the audible and visual uh, alarm that goes. And here's the, uh, the control panel that we fixed. And then there's the horn stroke. And for the security system, we have motion detectors throughout the building. Door contact lights, every door, and there's four doors. Uh, security panels right here in the third room. The audible alarm throughout the whole building. And, and here's the full cell phone, which serves part of the fire alarm. And for the motion detector, the audible alarm. Control panel in the uh, that's the fire alarm and the security panel in the third room. And then the security riser is similar to the fire alarm riser. And the door contacts, glass break, and the motion detector, <coughs> and the audible alarm. And that's just the security panel that you use. Glass break sensor that uh, you know, you know, there's five here, there's one here, one there, and then there's one in every room. <coughs> These are the motion detectors that we use. They come up to 36 feet. You can look here and you can see the degrees are on them. And here's the cell phone data system. We use voice data. Jack for every, every, for every cubicle, and then in every office, too. And we got this a wall phone on in the cubicle room, and then this is a wall phone in the electrical mechanical room, and in the lunch room. And there's just a kind of close up to see where they are. Here's the open office, and then every little, every office there. And here's the riser. It comes in from the cell phone company. And it goes out with a 66 phone jack with a 66 phone jack and 58 data jack throughout the building. Thank you, Andrew. Um, I'm going to detail a little bit more. Terry touched on the, uh, the one line diagram. And uh, this is the power system analysis where you can run reports on uh, over current detection and short circuit analysis. Pretty much what we did was we started with uh, the utility and the generator and you pretty much worked your way down with your whole electrical system. So each, uh, each component that you input has a tag here <coughs> that, uh, that describes where you're coming from. So for example, here's the cable going to the main terminal. Um, here's the cable going to the ATS. Um, here's the generator, circuit breaker, cable for the generator. And um, the get, <coughs> if you put in your input on the software, you double click on, you know, for example, the, uh, let's go to the main circuit breaker. I think that shows. Or circuit breaker for the air handling unit. I'm sorry. So in this, uh, options window, you can pretty much choose what um, what circuit breaker you want to put in there, all the different brands. We chose uh, Square D, and it's an adjustment circuit breaker. I believe our air handling unit was rated for 125 amps. So for the example, we just chose an adjustment trip. And by getting this uh, catalog, Pretty much, you click on the library, and it brings up hundreds of circuit breakers. I mean, you can see from color hammer, 
squarety demon. We just go with the squarety. Here's another example of put inputting the data into your riser for the cable. Um, this one is for the main panel. And uh, very similar to the window for the circuit breaker, you have all your input data here. So we chose um, to do two parallel runs of 250 kc mil, and it was a 20 foot run. And uh, we ran it in EMT with TH810, and very similar to <coughs> the other library, you can choose different uh, layouts. So for this particular one, we had we used four. It's really hard to read, but we chose four conductors, and you can see that for the like for an application where you you just run a three phase, or you just need three conductors, maybe. Uh, yeah. uh, moving on to overcurrent detection coordination. This is this particular example is for um, the air handling unit circuit breaker. Um, if this was a poor coordination, you, this this blue line represents the starting current of the air handling unit. If it was a poor coordination, this line would intersect with the circuit breaker here, which would show you uh, the inrush current looks like it'd be about 110 amps. Well, if this was intersected with this graph here, it would show the time that it takes for it to trip the circuit breaker. Um, usually you run into a poor coordination if you size your overcurrent detection incorrectly. Um, Here's a better example of a floor coordination. This is between the receptacle panel and the lighting panel. So if you had a fault in your receptacle panel, pretty much simultaneously the uh, main breaker and the lighting panel would trip at the same time, knocking out both panels, which would obviously be bad for your electrical system. If all three of these lines intersect with the main panel, it would obviously knock out the whole main panel. <laughs> That's pretty bad. Uh, to correct this, um, you can click on the settings. Right now it's set at high sensitivity. You can knock that down to low, which would move, shift this graph over so they're not intersecting. And the only <coughs> the drawback to that would be that you're going to have a greater fault current. Um, when you run your short circuit analysis. Which brings me to my short circuit summary. And uh, after we had all of our data inputted into our one line diagram, the whole system, we ran the fault analysis summary. And it gives you readings as far as at each bus name. So for the air handling unit bus, you're going to have 8,724 amps for a three-phase fault. Whereas if it was just a line to ground fault, you'd have 5,216. And the highest was at the meter terminal where you had pretty much 33,000 amps uh, for a three-phase fault and 18,000 kiloamps or 18 kiloamps for the uh, line to ground. And the reason for that is the impedance in the wire. So the closer, closer you are to the utility, the higher fault current. And the farther downstream you are on the system, you obviously have less. Uh, these are the R flash labels that um, per NEC code need to be on every <coughs> um, distribution equipment for the electrical system. And what they entail is the flash hazard at each equipment um, the proper PPE for qualified personnel to be working on that equipment live. Um, this is the meter terminal, so obviously that's pretty dangerous. And uh, yeah, that's about it.
I know it wasn't on your list to present, but nobody talked about it. But it's still on the <laughs> uh, Did you include any grounding requirements in your drawings, or are you just leaving it up to the contractor to comply with the code on that? Yeah, the contractor and the journeyman or foreman went over that they know the requirements. Um, <laughs> definitely should have touched on the grounding requirements. We, we found that we can learn from emergency We have not we have not touched on the separated drive system yet. That will be next project. <laughs> Just for the record, it's not their fault. <laughs> well, thank you very much. Hey, tell them you guys are staying. Um, no, no, no.